All right, Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. So that's the technique for taking a set of vectors that's not orthogonal with respect to some bigger product and making it orthogonal. And you might ask, what's the point of making something orthogonal? What's the great benefit of making something orthogonal? Well, we can decompose by dot product. Remember, when you have, we're going to stop. When you have a, a basis that's full of orthogonal vectors, and you have to decompose another vector v as the linear combination of the elements of the basis. When you say that a basis is orthogonal, it means that any two vectors in that basis are orthogonal to each other. That's what it means for an entire set to be orthogonal. Orthonormality is the additional condition that the base, that the vectors are unit length. Whether you're talking about length or the property of being orthogonal, the presence of an inner product is already implied. I wouldn't be able to make that statement if we didn't already have an inner product. But when that's the situation, you have an inner product, an operation that satisfies our three axioms. And you have a vector that you need to decompose with respect to that basis. You can do it by the dot product or by the inner product. The formula B, as we've discovered, you just have to dot, excuse me, V with EI and divide it by the dot product of EI with itself, the ith vector. So the ith coefficient is the inner product of V with the corresponding element of the basis divided by, can we say, length squared of that element? Yes, we can. Length comes from the inner product. And this works only when the basis is orthogonal. When this set of vectors consists of vectors such that any two are orthogonal to each other. Then you can use this. And this, especially in physics and applied math, is much more important than you can ever imagine. It's so important, you almost don't, your, don't notice yourself doing it. But I actually got an interesting comment on YouTube. Someone said, thanks for a review of, uh, of electromagnetism. And similarly, someone could have said, thank you for a review of quantum mechanics. The Brian <laughs> Kett related to this. And other things. Uh, so, it's so everywhere, what's the word for off the wear? Ubiquitous, that it'll blow your mind. But you can only do it when, it when the basis is orthogonal. So that's what makes orthogonal bases better than others in some way. In this way, in this particular way, you get something much more complicated if the basis is not orthogonal. And as you know, I'm the biggest proponent of the statement that all bases are created equal, unless you have a problem which prefers one basis over another. Well, if you have an inner product, a particular inner product is already partial to some bases, some bases over others. Which ones is it partial to? The ones that are orthogonal. You can't be orthogonal in abstraction. You're orthogonal with respect to that inner product. Which inner product do you use? Well, that's once again, the problem dictates the inner product. We'll see that when we're talking about Gaussian quadrature, hopefully next time. The problem dictates the inner product, then the inner product makes a contribution, at least, to dictating what basis to use. And what basis, what kind of basis would you like to use? Orthogonal. Does, do things get that much better when you go to an orthonormal basis? They don't really. It's just that the bottom numerator, denominator goes away, because it's one. That's a small advantage. In analytical work, it's an advantage that's not worth it because you end up with lots of square roots in trying to make everything unit length. Make sense? So orthogonal is much more important than orthonormal. But when you use the computer, you, the formula becomes even simple when, when it's orthonormal. So sometimes we'll push things to become orthonormal. Sometimes we'll just stop at orthogonal. Sometimes we'll stop an orthogonal and then later decide, let's go back and make it 
make them all unit length. So what do you do when the basis you're given is not orthogonal? Well, you make it orthogonal. And we've already discussed how to make it orthogonal. I'll just write down the formula without review because you can go watch that video. But if you have a vector, I think here is a good place to do it, uh, a vector A, drawing it horizontal for convenience only, and a vector B, and a vector B, and it's not orthogonal to A, once again, we're going back to geometric vectors for inspiration. But once the inspiration strikes us, and we capture it in a bottle with an algebraic expression, and then we observe that the algebraic expression has nothing but inner products in it, well then it immediately applies to all other linear spaces. So what do we do? What's the inspiration? The inspiration is to find the projection of B onto A, P, and then subtract it from B. And then you end up with this vector right here. Right? This is B minus P. Okay? And we'll call it B1 because we still want to think of it as related to B, but not, but not B. Something that it's basically the part of B that's orthogonal to A. Does it make sense to say it that way? We're kind of breaking up B into the part that's parallel to A and the part that's orthogonal to A. And we're only keeping the part that's orthogonal to A. A pretty clean thing to do. Okay? So, B1, the expression for B1, which I'm writing down without deriving it because we've derived it before, is Okay. Is this kind of obvious? Well, at least geometrically that that's what we need to do. I think the slightly challenging part was to capture this geometric strategy with an algebraic expression. That you might want to review, but geometrically this is obvious. You guys agree, right? And that's what's called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. It's mind-boggling in a way that something so simple, and I do think it's simple, Sometimes there's great danger in labeling something as simple once you've seen the solution. There are, there are very many problems that are impossible to solve that have proven to have simple solutions. And it's really you know, insulting to the person who discovered it to look at it in retrospect and call it simple. So I hesitate to, to say this, but I think I would have thought of the same thing Maybe? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. So it's just amazing. So it's just these two guys, I don't know much about them. I don't think they were particularly distinguished mathematicians. Again, I'm basing something on what I read on Wikipedia. So, you know, I'm characterizing human beings uh, according to what I read on Wikipedia. So that's probably some kind of a crime. But this guy seems to have been uh, a Hitler sympathizer. And he said in 1939 that, yes, we killed half a million Jews, but look how much better we are now. Uh, so it's amazing that anything at all is named after him. But that's, again, that's according to Wikipedia. Maybe he was just an amazing guy. But anyway, yes. So I don't think... Taking a great mathematician and naming this after a great mathematician, well, that would be great if this was Euler orthogonalization or Gauss, or probably more appropriately Cauchy orthogonalization, something that's probably when this sort of thing crystallized in these terms. Okay. But now, before we actually do it, you have to realize that what we have here applies to polynomials. <coughs> if I gave you two polynomials right now and an inner product, you have a recipe in front of you on what to do. You will find their inner product, you will find another inner product, you will find this linear combination, and you're done. You may be wondering, why am I doing this? You may be wondering, why are there inner products? All of those would be valid thoughts. But the fact that we now have a recipe that applies to all sorts of vector spaces is undeniable. 
And what makes it possible? In a product. And what's a little bit surprising about this is that I feel like I'm in an episode of Seinfeld. Uh, and what's a little bit surprising about it? That every geometric concept seems to find an expression in terms of inner product. That I haven't fully uh, wrapped my mind around. Why is it like that? But it just happens to be like that. Okay, that's the power of algebra. That's the power of algebra meeting geometry. The idea came from geometry. But once you express it algebraically, it takes on an entire new life of its own. That's the power of algebra. And power of algebra on its own, this is not me saying, this is Lagrange. I agree, which counts for nothing. But this is really Lagrange's insight. His claim was, when geometry was on its own, its development pretty much ended in ancient Greek, in ancient Greece. Algebra was a magnificent tool developed by Arabic scholars, but it on its own was also pretty limited. People were solving polynomial equations, they did quite a bit of number theory, but they didn't have what we have today, calculus, my goodness, all incredible subjects. When did that start happening? When algebra met geometry. So Fermat and Descartes had a lot to do with it, Cartesian coordinates, the idea of coordinates, the idea of imposing a grid, and all of a sudden geometric problems become algebraic problems. It, but it's that moment when you recognize that power, when something comes from geometry, and then gets expressed in algebra, and just acquires a power of its own. You can now forget where the problem came from, and keep using algebra, just the rules of algebra as you know them, and it will just get you results. You see it in elementary algebra. The distributive property, you write it down, it takes on a life of its own, and all of a sudden it, you can do these amazing things with it. So that's kind of what's happening here. We're now stepping into the realm of algebra, and we can almost forget where it came from. But then in the end, whatever we discover will feed back into geometry, and it's these two subjects together. You need the combination of both this kind of greatness, and fortunately we have it.